Someone, was, someone asked me not too long ago why I wrote this book. It was very simple. I told them I can't play golf. Their reaction at the time was, wait a minute. As John said, you were an investment banker for 25 years. How could you be an investment banker and not play golf? I said I could tell good stories. And I had 25 years of interesting stories. In the first half of my career, I actually told stories about Wall Street's sellers. Wall Street sellers is really an army of commercial banks and investment banks. I would think of these sellers in a way as gatekeepers, okay? Folks in a way who controlled markets, created markets, controlled access to markets, and controlled information about those markets. While the Wall Street buyers and I would think of them as the hedge funds, private equity firms, traditional money managers. For the most part of the 70s and 80s and 90s, had very limited power, had very limited influence. In many ways, they couldn't sit with the grown-ups. They couldn't sit with the sellers. But the, from the mid-90s on, in the last half of my career on Wall Street, I shifted my storytelling to the buyers. Things were changing. What we were seeing, in a way, was a sea of liquidity, an explosion, in a way, in financial technology, in financial information. And what was popping up, like mushrooms, okay, was buy-side advocates, who I will call the three E's, entrepreneurs, endowments, and electronic exchanges. So with liquidity, financial technology, access to information, as well as endowments like Columbia, the buy side, the upstarts, in a way, these private equity firms, these hedge funds, in a way, seize the reins of power away from the traditional sell side gatekeepers. They level the playing field. And for the first time, they can actually sit with the adults. They can enjoy the tasting menu. I had 25 years of those stories. But nothing, nothing like the stories we have seen in 2008. Nothing like the stories we're seeing every day in 2009. One of those stories, as we painfully know today, Wall Street was a house of cards. Two noteworthy cards from that deck. One, all the Wall Street firms <coughs> underplayed the right hand management. And two, all the Wall Street firms overplayed the wrong hand, the balance sheet. What do I mean? When I think of management, when I think of these Wall Street titans, I'm reminded of the captain of the Titanic. Remember the movie, the book? What was the captain of the Titanic? Someone who thought he was invincible. Someone who ignored the warning signs. Someone who said, full steam ahead. Well, guess what? Our captains of Wall Street were doing fine. They were navigating through a sea of liquidity. Until when? They hit the credit frozen iceberg. Or should I say, they smashed into the iceberg. As a result, they were guilty on three counts. Let's begin with guilt by omission. A number of these Wall Street CEOs, okay, buried their head in the sand. Instead of stepping forward and saying to us, hey, we have a problem. Let's try to fix it. I'll do whatever I can to fix it. They actually stepped backwards and hid behind others. Or better yet, were MIA, missing in action. At a time of alarming losses and write-offs, they couldn't be found. If some were guilty, OK, of omission, I would say others were guilty of commission. Some of these so-called Wall Street titans, OK, very early on in the credit crisis, late 2007, early 2008, came forward and told us, don't worry, the losses, the write-downs, 
behind us. It's contained. Well, as we know today, our Wall Street friends faced even more alarming, faced even more drastic write downs and losses. The problem wasn't contained in early 2008, as we all know today. Their expression, contained, was surely an understatement. But it's funny, when I think of their words, not to worry, the situation is contained, it actually brings back another memory. It, bring back, it brings back another interesting act, okay, of commission. Four years or so before the financial bubble burst, May 2003, President Bush, you might recall, landed on the aircraft carrier. And do you remember the banner hanging over the ship? Not contained, mission accomplished. Talk about lack of trust. Over time, as a result, folks had a lack of trust. Well, as the credit crisis, okay, raged on, we had a lack of confidence. This lack of confidence took over. Fear overran Wall Street's favorite word, greed. Doesn't happen very often when fear replaces greed on Wall Street. But when it does, and it did in 2008, the financial system goes down quickly. What do we do? We shoot first and answer questions second. And it's not clear if there's a floor to the elevator. Let me put it in more practical terms. In times of greed, pre-credit crisis, okay, we price risk too low. The credit window is open all night. In times of fear, which is the credit crisis, we price risk too high. And as we know, the credit window is closed day and night. Let me give you an interesting example of that. Let me show you how the markets right now are pricing risk too high. The current equity values, right? The current equity markets are pricing risk or pricing the equity markets as if we're in a recession. That's fair. But the credit markets are pricing themselves today as if we are in a Great Depression. The markets are out of whack. Fear. Thinking, thinking about and going further back in time, in 2003, sorry, I like to play history, okay? Our Wall Street captains are guilty of a third count. They took a page from Russia's World War II playbook. What did Russia, or more interestingly, what did Stalin do when he entered World War II? He shot the generals. What did our Wall Street captains do? They shot the risk managers. They shot the senior executives. They shot the people who could have helped the CEOs navigate through the crisis. They could have helped the CEO say no. OK? So while we were underplaying management, Wall Street couldn't help themselves. And they were overplaying the balance sheet. All the Wall Street firms, OK, were dancing to the same tune. That, and that tune had four words. Asset heavy, equity light. These Wall Street firms were stretching the balance sheet. Leverage, more leverage, supersized leverage. Until that band, that balance sheet broke. I'm OK with leverage up to a point. High leverage numbers, which these guys were playing in, 80% of the time is OK. Great profits. High leverage numbers the other 20% of the time, 
it will catch up with you. And you are guaranteed to implode. 